Hello everyone, my name is David Garner. In this presentation, I'm sharing a topic um, from a class I teach as a CEU. And this is a shortened version of that, but I wanted to, to share it with everyone uh, on the internet without having to pay for it. Um, this way you can get the core of the material from my class without having to pay a fee or um, sign up for a subscription. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. So we're talking about addressing the spiritual domain as a healthcare professional. So as the title implies, this class is really directed at people who are currently working in the healthcare field, uh, whatever profession this uh, presentation is general information that all of us can use, whether we're a doctor, a nurse, um, a therapist, a CNA, um, social worker, and everything in between. Anyone who has direct contact with patients, uh, I think, could potentially learn something from this presentation. Let's go ahead and jump in. Let me tell you a little bit about who I am. Uh, my name is David, and uh, I have two different professions. Um, I attended Tennessee State University, where I received my master's in occupational therapy, and I've been practicing for about five years, primarily with the adult population. But before OT school, I worked at a Christian summer camp for about 10 years, where I gained experience as a spiritual mentor. I'm a published author, including two books and a few dozen articles, though a few of those relate to what I do now. And most recently, I completed a training program in which I was certified as an associate chaplain through the United States Chaplain Corps. And this was followed up by additional training and certification in chaplaincy for psychological first aid. And this enables me to work as a first responder chaplain, primarily with FEMA and other groups responding to natural disasters, things like that. Real quick, what is a chaplain? I think there's a lot of confusion about what exactly a chaplain is in the healthcare field. Um, my personal definition, we're kind of a professional friend and mentor all rolled into one. We listen, provide counsel and support, and most importantly, we provide presence. We serve people from all backgrounds. Uh, chaplains often come from some religious background, but there are also atheist and humanist chaplains, and uh, no one really has a monopoly on the field. And um, briefly, Hospital chaplaincy specifically arose in the 1920s, and it established modern training principles, which emphasize psychology, the medical model, and an emphasis on scientific research. So chaplaincy training is typically a master's degree, and it's different from theological or seminary training. While chaplaincy is historically Christian, Today, all the major world religions have trained chaplains. And even as I said, there are training programs um, for non-spiritual, um, atheist, etc. cetera, uh, chaplains. Lastly, chaplains are considered part of the treatment team. Today, I wanna discuss your role in addressing spirituality with your patients as a medical professional. Uh, does the spiritual domain matter to us as healthcare providers? That's one of the big questions I want to cover. In my opinion, addressing the spiritual domain is incredibly important. And if you're wondering about definitions, we're going to get to those. What is spirituality? So this is perhaps the biggest debate in human history. I think that might be fair to say. 
People have fought and died over religion and the correct form of spirituality for millennia. And every person can hold a slightly different definition. Um, in preparation for this class, uh, I looked up Merriam-Webster's definition and there was like nine different entries. So there's a lot of variations in the way that we can use the word spirituality. Um, but I like the APA definition, the American Psychological Association. It defines it as a concern for things of the spirit or soul, especially as opposed to the material. And uh, the spiritual domain could be described as that aspect of the human being that is concerned with one's purpose, with one's sense of self, with connecting to others, and with connecting to something greater than oneself. And then spirit is a word that has a wide variety of uses. Um, when we refer to our spirit or our spirits, this usually indicates our mental or emotional state. It can refer to how hopeful we are, like we may some we may say something like he is in low or high spirits. Uh, lastly, not everyone prefers the word spirituality. Some people describe themselves as non-spiritual, and I think we should respect that. So researchers have developed various models of development of spirituality. But the OG of spiritual development is James W. Fowler. He pioneered the concept back in the 80s with his primary stages of faith. And there are seven stages that are age-related. And this list is primarily based on the work of psychologists Erickson and Piaget. This scale is well-researched and backed by extensive empirical data. I won't bore you with all the details today. I just wanted to illustrate that spirituality is a well-researched topic, and you can come back and look at these stages in detail if you want. Next here is a more simplified set of stages, just to help visualize the progression that many people follow throughout their life. Um, ages aren't attached to this list, and I think that people can progress through the stages at different rates, some quickly, others more slowly, or maybe there's the later stages they never even achieve. Um, you know, some people, though, I think occasionally progress pretty quickly, even to the later stages. And this is the type of person you may have heard uh, described as an old soul, even at a young age. Um, this list of stages is not based on scientific research. I just think it's helpful to kind of visualize uh, where someone might be along their spiritual journey. Okay, one big question that may have come to mind when you first saw the title of this presentation is, am I talking about sharing your faith, faith sharing? Uh, when I talk about addressing spirituality, um, that's not necessarily what I'm referring to. Other questions that may have come to mind are, is it okay to pray with your patients? What about passing out tracts or inviting them to your Bible study or some other religious function? Um, I think what we have to do is keep in mind the ethics of working as a healthcare professional. Uh, medical care equals no discrimination. We treat everyone equally. And ethical care means that we respect boundaries. Uh, we'll discuss this more as we go along, but uh, I want to point out that we will be talking about these questions. All right. Some common myths that exist uh, about spirituality, even among healthcare professionals. Uh, number one, patients don't want to discuss spiritual issues with medical staff. Um, spiritual issues 
only happen to patients on hospice. Number three, spiritual leaders like pastors or priests are the only ones who can address spiritual needs. Uh, number four, cognitive impairment means people can't comprehend spiritual topics or they don't have spiritual needs. Number five, I'm not a person of faith as a healthcare professional, therefore I shouldn't bother about it. And number six, I don't know what my patient's religion or their beliefs are, so I probably shouldn't bring it up. All right, should we as healthcare professionals provide spiritual care? Well, some of your patients are going to present to you broken, not just physically, but also spiritually and emotionally. Uh, some will present with spiritual and emotional distress. And of course, this varies from one setting to another, uh, but it's present throughout the continuum of care. So let's look at what some of the research says around these myths that were in the previous slide. So bullet number one, uh, a new poll was conducted by the Pew Research Center and published in December of 2023, and it found that roughly 70% of Americans consider themselves spiritual, and a further higher percentage at 81% believed there is something spiritual beyond the natural world. If you're watching from another country, um, I didn't look at global stats, but I think there are people who consider themselves spiritual in every country. So you're bound to encounter them in your practice at some point. All right, bullet number two, religious commitment has been found to be helpful for many people in the prevention of illness, including depression, substance abuse, and physical illness. Uh, it's found to be helpful in coping with illness and in recovering from it. It is not only helpful at the end of life, but throughout the lifespan. And you can see I cited two studies here, but there's a plethora of research backing the statement. In another study, 94% of patients admitted to hospitals reported they believe that spiritual health is as important as physical health. And maybe this is kind of intuitive, right? If your spirits are low, you probably won't be motivated to improve your physical health. All right, next one, 77% of these patients in the same survey believe that physicians should consider their patient's spiritual needs as part of their medical care. Now I want you to think for a minute of all the doctors that you know or work with, uh, how many of them really take the time to consider and ask about their patient's spiritual needs. Of the ones I know, I think uh, too few really take this seriously. Um, and another study, or yeah, different study, uh, was found that up to 63% of patients who have an overnight stay in a medical facility experience spiritual distress. Um, I'll also add that caregivers can experience spiritual distress as a result of their loved one's medical event. So that's another thing to watch out for. Another study found that most terminally ill patients wish all frontline medical staff were able to recognize they were having a spiritual crisis so they could empath empathize and refer. So this listing of research suggests that addressing the spiritual domain is very beneficial for our patients and a number of patients um, do wish that we would pay more attention to this. All right, so the goal of all pro medical professionals is treating others the way we would want to be treated or perhaps the way we, we would want our grandmas treated. Our goal as medical providers is care, not convert. So when we think about providing spiritual care um, or addressing the spiritual domain, 
it's really about providing basic spiritual care, not trying to convert others to our faith or our religion, etc. And personally, as a Christian, I try to take my cues from Jesus's example. He always discussed his teachings in a public space where people had the choice to leave or stay and listen or not listen if they desired. But our patients are often stuck in their bed or their room without the ease of walking away if they choose. Thus, the healthcare setting is not the appropriate form for proselytization. While we may not proselytize, we still uh, care for the whole person, mind, body, and soul. So let's strive to provide whole person care and not neglect any aspect. All right, and let's just briefly review what nurses learn in school. Uh, many professions have similar understanding of the presence of spiritual domain of, of the presence of the spiritual domain among their patients. Uh, but sadly, many schools don't really emphasize how to address this domain. But nurses typically learn about the theory of human caring. And this theory says that the patient is made up of mind, body, and spirit. We are more than just physical beings, more than just our uh, body and our emotions. And the role of faith, hope in nursing care is described as the following. When modern science has nothing further to offer the person, the nurse can continue to use faith, hope to provide a sense of well-being through beliefs which are meaningful to the individual. And spiritual care is the domain of all medical staff and primarily provided by nursing staff, not by pastors or priests or even chaplains, but primarily by nursing staff and other staff also. And this is according to the USCC training manual. So what does spiritual care look like? Our role as medical professionals in providing spiritual care, I think it comes down to two main aspects. One, we address the spiritual domain when needed. Most, in most cases, I spend maybe five minutes uh, discussing emotional state and spiritual situation. Uh, for example, you walk into a room and you see your patient in tears. And instead of just uh, walking away and coming back later when they're not crying anymore, um, you know, I'll try and spend a few minutes and just attempt to understand what's going on. And by providing whole person care, I'm often able to help them calm down. Sometimes this can even reduce their need or desire for medication. And they're usually much more pleasant to the staff, meaning everybody has a better day. Second, um, occasionally we may be able to facilitate the patient's ability to participate in spiritual or religious rituals and activities of choice. So spiritual and religious tasks are important to many of our patients. And I think we should at minimum inquire if our patients are having trouble participating in their preferred uh, spiritual or religious tasks or occupations. For example, many uh, for many religious people, daily reading of sacred texts is a lifelong habit, right? Um, you may have known someone like this. I had a fellow church member uh, who read through the entire Bible every single year and had done so for decades. And I'm talking the paperback version, not audio. So 
how would he feel if after a stroke he's laying in the hospital and he suddenly can't do that anymore because he's unable to turn the pages of his bible that might negatively impact a patient's general mood in a significant way so these are areas we can absolutely address and they may not even take much time to address it's simply a matter of asking our patients about their own goals and barriers to spiritual and religious occupations. Even if we cannot help them with their task, perhaps we can refer to social work uh, to make needed accommodations, or maybe we can help them contact a spiritual mentor. But it begins with attending to their spiritual domain. Why should we address spirituality? So you are probably aware that there's an anxiety epidemic in America and other Western countries right now and has been going on for several years. Perhaps you've heard the statistic that about 60% of people who commit suicide visit a healthcare facility within 30 days prior to their attempt. Recent research has pointed to pain being an emotional response. So these are just three of many reasons why addressing the spiritual and emotional domains of our patients is important. Uh, some studies have found that prayer may be linked to the emotional region of the brain. And if pain is also, then there may be an underlying biologic link that causes prayer to improve emotional state and pain, even physical pain, at least in some people. Uh, so I think it's important that we are in tune with our patient's spiritual demeanor so that we can pick up on any signs something isn't right. And I don't think it's limited to these aspects only. But if we can reach out and raise their spirits or put them in contact with beneficial resources, I think we should. But it starts with noticing their spiritual state. And um, ultimately, I think addressing spiritual the spiritual domain helps improve our patients' outcomes overall. Uh, if you're interested in reading more, I highly recommend the article listed at the link there on that slide. How do we recognize when a patient is experiencing spiritual issues or distress? Well, I don't think it's real difficult, but let's go back to the definition of spirituality real quick I mentioned earlier. Uh, the definition says, spirituality is a concern for things of the spirit or soul, especially as opposed to the material. So we need to keep in mind that not everyone belongs to a religion. Religion, faith, and spirituality are terms we can sometimes use interchangeably. Um, but just because someone does not claim a religion or attend a church or a mosque regularly doesn't mean that they don't consider themselves spiritual or have a spiritual side. Uh, most people describe themselves as having some sort of spiritual side, and it may be as straightforward as an awe for nature or the sublime, but the thing is that we need to be open to the possibility that they may or that they do have a spiritual side, and that spirituality may be out of whack in some regard, uh, maybe even rising to the level of spiritual distress. Spiritual distress does not always present as a crisis of faith. Um, it can appear different in each person, and it can be intertwined with emotional distress and loneliness. But here are some major signs and symptoms you can watch out for. Stress and anxiety, comments about loneliness, 
and expressing feelings of being punished or forgotten by God. These are three telltale signs, especially when they occur together, that someone is experiencing pretty serious spiritual distress and emotional distress. So how do we provide spiritual care as healthcare professionals? When it becomes apparent that a patient is in some sort of acute emotional state, that's all you need to know that it's appropriate to provide spiritual care. While we may not be experts in mental, emotional, or spiritual care, all of us can take these three actions. Provide spiritual first aid, screen and refer, and provide presence. Spiritual first aid. One day before I became a chaplain, I was working as an occupational therapist and I walked into a patient's room and he immediately shouted, why does God hate me? How can we respond to signs of spiritual distress like this? Step one, by providing a bit of spiritual first aid. And how do we do that? What is spiritual first aid? Well, this is my term for providing a space to share and a listening ear. When you realize someone is in some sort of emotional or spiritual distress, inquire about their emotional state and what makes them feel that way or say that. If they haven't said anything, but you sense a fearful or distressed state, just ask them about it. You can say something like, how are you doing in your heart? You know, right in here. How are you coping with everything? How are you doing emotionally? These are questions for people of any or even no faith background. So you don't have to know whether or not they describe themselves as spiritual to use these questions. And notice that I didn't just ask, how are you doing? Because that's a common phrase we use every day. And people have learned to give a masked answer. Oh, I'm doing good. I'm fine. When in reality, they may be dealing with a lot of emotional turmoil inside. Got something in my eye. So specifying exactly what you're asking about is a good thing to get underneath or get behind that mask. Now, once you have asked this question, then let them some time to respond. Provide a listening ear. And they may say some very dramatic things uh, if you give them the chance. And when that happens, um, don't immediately counter their statements. Instead, try and ask them to explain. For example, when I walked into that room and the patient shouted, why does God hate me? Right? My initial response, especially being a Christian might be, God doesn't hate you, right? It says so right in the Bible. Well, but that's not really a helpful response in that, in that situation um, because it just pushes back against their emotional pain. It's much more helpful to allow them a few minutes, if possible, to share while you listen actively and without judgment. And then you can try and summarize what you hear back to them. And that lets them know that you understood um, what they were saying, especially if their words and thoughts were a bit rambling. Um, so the key here is that um, we want to give them a chance to just explain what it is they're feeling inside. And then um, we want to avoid 
offering solutions immediately. So once we open up this Pandora's box, right, uh, it can get uncomfortable, uncomfortable pretty quickly um, in the presence of another person's pain. And so we may try and fix it real quick. Well, have you tried blank, right? We've probably all said something like that or had it said to us. Instead, active listening is one of the best things you can do in most situations. Uh, it is real spiritual first aid. And sometimes saying nothing is the best thing you can do. There are occasionally scenarios where words just fail me. And that's okay. Just being there in the moment with that person, be, having another human being there in the silence with them, can be cathartic in itself. Um, in many patient satisfaction surveys, one of the top two uh, most important aspects reported by patients about their experience is staff who listen. So if you want to help address their issue, really start by listening. And then you could go on to say something like, is there anything I can do for you right now? It shows compassion for their plight, but resist the urge to immediately offer uh, other types of specific solutions. All right, so that was step one. Step two, we can screen and refer um, if you deem it helpful to the proper e experts. So most hospitals have chaplain on staff. Nursing homes usually have pastors, priests, or chaplains they can call when a patient wants to talk to them. So I encourage you to get to know these people where you work and learn how to make referrals to them. Some hospitals include questions about religious preference and visitation needs at admission. In fact, um, in the United States, all hospitals are required to do this, but after admission, many don't ever bring it up again. A few good outpatient clinics also inquire about this, but it's pretty rare in that setting um, from what I understand. But really every setting is appropriate to screen for the spiritual needs of a patient. Um, if you work in an outpatient office or home health or some other non-hospital setting, I would also encourage you to find local resources that you can refer your patients to when appropriate. Uh, we will discuss a few of these at the end, but uh, beyond listening, like we talked about in step one, um, referring to an expert who can really invest the time in listening long-term and conversing with the patient about their spiritual or emotional or other issues um, is one of the best things that you can do. Of course, some may not be open to that, but if they are open to it, um, referring can be really helpful. So when is it appropriate to screen? Um, it's appropriate to screen any patient that's in emotional or spiritual distress to determine their needs. Uh, you don't have to determine whether it's specifically spiritual or emotional. Um, and research has suggested that emotional distress and spiritual distress often go together. So if a patient appears in distress, then it's okay to screen. How do you screen for spiritual needs? Well, um, there are different approaches, but I've worked for a couple years uh, with a few chaplains to design a short seven question screen of spiritual needs. And it's appropriate for any setting and no training is really necessary. So I'm giving this to you to use. It's one option. There are other um, screens out there you can find on the internet, but I think this one is straightforward and concise. Some of them get kind of lengthy. Uh, this one can be completed as quickly as one to two minutes, and it provides recommendations for follow-up, whereas some of the others out there don't. So uh, the main questions 
in the survey of spiritual needs are one, are you at peace? Two, do you feel unhappy or distressed? Three, what are your sources of hope, strength, and comfort? Four, what spiritual practices or religious practices do you have? Five, are there any ways we, the staff, can support you better? Six, would you like help connecting with someone important to you? And seven, would you like to talk to a chaplain or a mental health professional? So it's not necessary to screen a patient before referring the patient to a chaplain or a mental health professional on site, but I think it can be helpful if you have the time. All right. Step number three, continue to provide presence. The best thing you can do to address a patient's spiritual side is be present, emotionally and physically. Implement active listening, smile, and help them know you care. Avoid saying, I understand, about what they're going through. I encourage you to remove this phrase from your vocabulary. Instead, it's much more empathetic to say something like, I don't understand what you're experiencing. I'm sorry blank is happening to you. I care and I will do my best to help you in any way that I can. It's a natural human instinct to try and understand and fix their issues, but they generally don't expect you to understand exactly what they've been through or to fix their issues. They simply want someone to listen. So, if you've conducted the previous survey of spiritual needs, then you may have learned what brings them hope and comfort. Um, instead of offering solutions or uh, other tactics, you can direct the conversation to these topics. Ultimately, listen, smile, and care. That's how we provide the vast majority of spiritual care in medical settings. And a note on time restraints, right? We're all very busy in the medical field. So it's okay to be firm with your time restraints if you state it gently. If you know that the patient you're about to go see is verbose, or you know that you only have X amount of time to let them talk, tell them at the beginning, I have X amount of time. And if they still carry on and on, you may need to gently interrupt them. And that's okay. Uh, you can say something like, thank you for sharing with me. I wish I had more time to listen, but right now I have to go do blank. I'll come back if I can. So stating things matter of factly and kindly and gently uh, creates a environment where the patient will be much more understanding. I think it cut off the bottom of my words here, but it says listen, smile, and care at the bottom of the slide. All right. Another approach you can use is to teach anxiety management. Uh, it's appropriate if you deem it helpful and you have the time. Generally, teaching these techniques doesn't take more than a few minutes, but um, sometimes you may not even have that. But if you do, uh, teaching deep breathing techniques like um, just in and out, slow deep breathing or triangle breathing where you um, picture a triangle and you breathe in for a given amount of time, maybe like three to five seconds. Then you hold the breath for three to five seconds. That's kind of across the bottom. And then you exhale slowly to complete the triangle for three to five seconds. That um, can be a very calming technique. Of course, written journaling, uh, audio journaling, if they have difficulty writing, sometimes simply providing them pen and paper uh, is enough to 
re help relieve some of their anxiety. Also, uh, the drowning journal technique is one I really like to teach. So instead of just writing out uh, your issues line by line or sentence by sentence, you're just going to take a piece of paper and write like one to two word descriptors of the things that are stressing you out on top of each other until they're completely drowned in ink. So I like to do this when I'm trying to go to sleep, but things are racing through my mind and I can't quiet it down. So you can just start writing words on top of each other. So finances, family, sickness, uh, my future, um, housing issues, friend issues, church issues, and you can see as it goes along, eventually, if you write enough on top of each other, you can't even read the words anymore. And so your problems are kind of drowned in ink. And uh, I like it also because it keeps it private. Um, as someone comes along and picks up the piece of paper, they won't really be able to decipher uh, what issues were written down there. Okay. In summary, spiritual care is simple. Be kind, be caring, be empathetic. Now let's briefly discuss documenting spiritual care. So, um, as I've stated, generally addressing the spiritual domain either lasts roughly five minutes or the conversation takes place maybe during another activity like passing medications. Um, addressing the spiritual domain is part of what we as healthcare professionals do. So it's well worth it if I spend five to 20 minutes out of my day to lift someone's spirits so they can be or feel more motivated to face the day or get better. Sometimes they're, um, these people that need spiritual care are the problem patient on the floor. However, after I take the time to listen and care, they become much more agreeable. Uh, typically, I only have like one patient per day who might even need this kind of attention. So I think it doesn't really take that much time um, to address. But if I do address it, I do think it's generally beneficial to document um, the conversation. It may not necessarily uh, be legally required to document spiritual care, but I think it's best because if it's not written down, then it never happened, right? Not only does documenting it cover you from liability, but it also helps alert the treatment team that the patient has spiritual interests or needs, right? If you're a nurse and you document a brief conversation that you had about spiritual topics, then the nurse that comes after you may see that, or even the doctor may see that, and it helps alert the team of the patient's desires. So generally, um, I keep this documentation to one, maybe two sentences. So very brief, such as uh, patient presented distraught and requested this nurse or whatever you are to offer a prayer, patient calm following prayer, done. Or patient stated, why is God punishing me? This doctor conducted survey of spiritual needs and shared findings of patient requesting chaplain visit with the case manager. Done. Um, so keep it simple, but stick it in there um, when you can, um, especially maybe if it gets um, intense or heated somehow. Uh, I definitely would probably try and document that or also if they make specific requests um, for a visit from someone or some sort, they're asking for some sort of accommodation or it impacts their treatment somehow. Those types of things definitely need to be documented. All right, guidelines for prayer. 
So is it okay to pray with your patient? In general, um, I think it's okay as long as it's offered in a respectful manner and the patient or the family requests and agrees to the prayer. So if you're concerned about your specific facility, I would encourage you to discuss their policy with your manager or local chaplain. Um, however, here are a few guidelines that I would recommend around prayer. So if you're going to offer a prayer, always ask the patient if they desire prayer in a way that allows them to say no. Would you like me to offer a prayer instead of let's pray about it? So this goes back to the ethics of treating everyone equally and not assuming uh, a patient's beliefs or religion. Uh, a couple other practices um, that I recommend, these don't come from any institution, they're just things that I've learned. One, I think it's typically best to stay in your wheelhouse. Um, and what I mean is maybe only pray with patients from the same religion as you. This way you avoid offense. Um, either way, I always ask the patient's faith tradition before offering prayer so I can adjust my words to avoid offense. Uh, two, keep your prayer generic and short. Avoid intimate touch during prayer. That's generally best. Um, if you're hesitant to lead in prayer, simply ask the patient if they would like to offer the prayer instead. And uh, five, pray to God and avoid other terms. You know, um, some Christians call God the Father Daddy as they pray. Others might see this as disrespectful, and others have, you know, various names for God or uh, their deity, but God is generally a pretty safe term. If you don't feel comfortable praying with your patient, that's okay. But if they ask for it, ask them if they'd like to have someone come by to pray with them. So this is another chance to refer to a chaplain. Um, alternatively, you can keep a poem on hand to share instead of a prayer. So that would be appropriate for all religions or people of no religion or faith. It comes down to this. Only do what you're comfortable with and be respectful. And always leave the control in the hands of the patient. When is faith sharing appropriate? Okay, now we're getting into uh, an ethical topic. Is faith sharing ever appropriate? Um, I think it depends. Most of the time, definitely not. Uh, but if you discover the patient and yourself uh, both share the same faith, then it may be a bonding topic for you. But... It is unethical to proselytize your denomination or religion or lack of one uninvited in medical settings. So, right, let's think about maybe an extreme example. So if a doctor um, is also a cult leader and they're actively attempting to recruit patients, that probably wouldn't be okay. I mean, you probably wouldn't want that doctor around your grandma especially if she's not as sharp as she used to be, right? Um, that could really start bre breaking some ethical boundaries pretty quickly. So my rule of thumb is this. If the patient asks about my faith, then I can discuss it. Um, otherwise, I shouldn't really be talking about it. Uh, if they ask for spiritual literature, I'll do my best to provide them with non not non-denominational material, um, or whatever they request. Um, also, you can document these exchanges. Um, and 
you can indicate that the patient asked. Um, so my goal, I want there to be zero doubt about my intentions. So if I'm discussing my faith tradition or the doctrines I believe in with a patient, I might document that uh, just one or two sentences uh, and briefly explain that they asked about it. Um, you know, I have had these conversations come up before. Um, I've had patients try and witness to me and convert me on the spot. And uh, but we want to make sure as professionals that we are avoiding those types of interactions. All right. Resources. So here I have linked a few resources, um, some directly for you to use as a professional and others um, are ones that you could provide directly to your patients. So first, I would refer you to your local facility chaplain. Um, they're there to serve the patients, but they're also there to serve medical staff. This was especially prevalent during the pandemic when um, a lot of medical professionals were under a ton of stress and anxiety. And if they were people of faith, they may not have even been able to go to church or uh, synagogue or what have, what have it. So um, they're there to serve both. So I do encourage you to get to know the local facility chaplain, if there is one where you work. Um, uh, next is the survey of spiritual needs. So there's a link there to the full survey that you can get and use as you see fit. Um, then also there's a link to a podcast I did a few years back um, about the same topic. So in the podcast, I interview uh, various medical professionals uh, each episode, doctor, nurse, uh, therapist. So that was really fascinating to learn from other people's experience and perspective. You can check it out on Apple Podcasts and most other uh, places. Then I linked the HOPE questionnaire. Um, I mentioned that there are other questionnaires and surveys like the Survey of Spiritual Needs. Um, the HOPE is one I do like. It is designed for use by doctors primarily, especially with terminally ill patients, but it's not necessarily exclusive to that. And so you can go to that link and read through the questions. Uh, you might find it enlightening, or you may find you prefer that to my survey. Um, so there's options for you. Lastly, are community resources that you can provide to patients. So again, I encourage you to find ones in your local community that you can use, but there is the USCC 24 hour chaplain hotline. Um, it's kind of like, uh, you know, the suicide prevention hotline or others like that, where you can call any time of day or night and talk directly to a chaplain um, on the phone. And then also, um, you know, sometimes patients do appreciate a referral to a mental health counselor. But sadly, um, at least in the United States, we have a lot of people here who cannot afford those types of resources. And so I think it's helpful um, to let patients know that churches can sometimes offer similar resources. So especially um, mega churches in larger cities, there are the pastors of these churches are often willing to sit down and counsel or discuss a patient's life issues, um, whether or not they're a member, and many times free of charge. So um, they will provide the service for free to walk-ins, um, or some of them do have um, appointments available, especially bigger churches will. So while 
pastors and priests are not mental health professionals. Nowadays, pretty much all um, seminaries and training programs for religious professionals includes some sort of classes on the principles of psychology and counseling. Um, not just in the Christian faith, but in um, the Islamic faith, in the Jewish faith. Um, a lot of spiritual leaders nowadays are trained, at least minimally, in counseling techniques. So they often have some level of knowledge and experience in talking with people to help them through their life struggles. So I encourage people to reach out to a local church. Maybe um, it's one across the street, or maybe it's a big church downtown, or a big synagogue, or whatever the case, whatever, um, you know, setting they may feel most comfortable with, whatever faith tradition they may feel comfortable with. Uh, so I encourage some of my patients to reach out to those sorts of resources if I think they might be open to it. All right, that was a long explanation, but uh, in closing, I hope some of what I've shared with you today was already obvious to you, but perhaps I was able to broaden your understanding of the benefits uh, and methods by which we can address the spiritual domain with our patients. Um, our goal is to serve them better. So thank you for watching. Um, if you have questions, that I did not address, feel free to leave a comment below and I'll do my best to get around to answering it at some point. Thank you for watching and have a blessed day.